These men and women have come home to Greece after 30 years' exile in Eastern Europe. Between 1947 and 1949, they fought on the left in a bitter and tragic civil war in Greece. They lost, and now for the first time, they can tell their story. When we came back to the village, we were talking about the civil war and remembering the evil that happened. Brother killed brother. Is there anything worse than that? There isn't. We lost so many children in the civil war. Eighty children were killed in this village. And brother fought brother. I can't forget everything. Every night I go to bed and I talk to myself. I start from the beginning and I go all the way through to the end. Late in 1940, the Italians invaded Greece. The Greeks repelled them and for a while were Britain's only ally against the German-Italian Axis. But in May 1941, after the fall of Crete to German troops, the whole of Greece came under Nazi control. The Greek king and his government fled abroad. We didn't want to be humiliated after our victory against the Italians. It wasn't just the students who felt it. All Greeks felt the same. We didn't want the swastika, the symbol of fascism, to infect the Acropolis. We were so shocked to see it up there that we wanted to bring it down. We chose the day when the Germans occupied Crete. The moment Crete was occupied, we said, we must take it down, now. The resistance against the German occupation started within weeks. It was also a national liberation movement against the return of the dictatorship of General Mataksas, who had ruled Greece from 1936, and against the return of the king who had supported him. People hated the dictatorship of Metaxas and the king. Together they oppressed the Greek people. We didn't want in any way to go back to the same tyrannical regime which was supported from abroad after the liberation. That regime was hated by all Greeks. The Greek dictator, General Metaxas, had intended that his regime should revive the glories of the Greek past. But there had been disturbingly fascist overtones. Political opposition had been crushed, opponents interned, and civil liberties denied. In September 1941, the Greek Communist Party, KKE, formed the National Liberation Front, AM. It became the largest resistance movement. Recruitment was by word of mouth. AM was organized by those who had been exiled to the islands by Metaxas and who had escaped. They came and immediately organized the first resistance against the occupation forces. I was an engineer, and I joined because a colleague in our office told me, you know, there is a resistance organization which got started at the Albanian front. And immediately we got organized. My brother was an old prisoner of the Metaxas dictatorship. As soon as he came back from the Albanian front, where we had beaten the Italians, he said, don't just sit there, you must join. And he 
immediately put me in touch with someone who was organizing resistance amongst actors. When the Allies imposed a trade blockade on occupied Europe, Greece was particularly hard hit. In the winter of 1941, 300,000 Greeks died of hunger. It was a fight for survival and food. The first thing we did was to organize free meals. The National Survival Committee was the best idea EAM ever had. We threatened general strikes and we forced the Nazis to start giving free meals and a portion of oil every day. By early 1942, Elas, the military arm of AM, was building up pockets of armed resistance in the mountain villages. The person around whom the AM organization was formed was the local Communist Party representative. We were liberals. We belonged to the bourgeois parties. So we hadn't got a clue about underground organizing. The Communist Party, of course, had its own structure and was highly organized. It didn't bother us in the least that it was the Communist Party representative who was organizing us. On the contrary, we worked very well together throughout the struggle against the Axis occupation. In the village of Ziakas in central Greece, almost the entire population joined Elas to fight the Italian occupying forces. The Italians used to come into the village and beat people. We fled from the village and hid in the mountain. The children were crying from hunger. The goals of Elas were to set us free. We were all peasants, and when we were asked to join the resistance, we did so with heart and soul. We looked after the wounded. We baked bread all night. We knitted, washed, and transported things. Whatever was necessary, really. When we came back to the village from the mountain, the Italians had killed all the pigs and cows we hadn't been able to take with us. There was nobody here. Everyone had gone to the mountain. The whole village, when we came back, it was deserted. In the mountains, recruitment to Elas was done openly, often inspired by Aris Velukiotis, a communist who had been imprisoned by Metak Sas. <laughs> When Aris Velochiotis came here in 1942 with about 60 or 70 of his Elas partisans, we all gathered in the square with people who had come from surrounding villages. Aris began to explain the goals of EAM, which were to get everyone to work together to liberate Greece. He said that anyone could join EAM Elas, regardless of their political beliefs. He also told us that he would attack the occupying forces at any opportunity, that he didn't know what kind of reprisals would follow, but that we should be prepared to try and defend ourselves. Some of the villagers followed him and became partisans. The rest helped the resistance in different ways. We helped, for instance, at the hospital, washing the clothes and linen, whatever was needed. I was a teacher. So I moved around from one village to another. I taught the children and tried to instill national pride in them. We prepared the older ones to join Elas. At the same time, we developed the cultural life in the village. We set up theaters with plays and songs for the children. <laughs> On the whole, the clergy in the countryside supported Elas enthusiastically. Wherever they went, the village priest was always the first to welcome the partisans. Many monasteries were used as hospitals for the wounded partisans. Whatever monasteries had, 
like animals and food, they gave to Elas. Success in skirmishes against the Italian forces brought in more volunteers, but the price of this resistance was high. By then, we were a group of about 35 Elas partisans, and we were in the mountain villages of Banasidas. The occupying forces have been reinforced by units of collaborators who were trying to collect attacks from us. We attacked them then and managed to disarm them and take the food they got and distribute it amongst the villagers. By now, Elas was a widespread resistance movement and in grim conditions was tying down large numbers of German units. It was at this time that British plans for post-war Greece began to clash with those of Aam Elas, and the seeds of the Greek Civil War were sown. The Foreign Office view of the Elias guerrillas was that they were the military arm of a communist front organization, EAM. As such, they were primarily interested in establishing themselves in such a way as to be able to seize power when the Germans withdrew. The main problem was that we had an interest, a long-standing interest in Greece as part of the Mediterranean with our lines of communication through to India, Suez Canal, Egypt. We did not want to see Greece handed on a platter to Joe Stalin along with the rest of the Balkans. Eam's goal was to make Greece independent, free from all ties. We knew from the start that the British wanted to keep Greece within their sphere of influence in the Mediterranean, for their own political ends. Am was opposed to this, and so the British were against us from the start. In Greece, as in Yugoslavia, the British were confronted with a dilemma. How could they reconcile their short-term military need to work with left-wing resistance movements with their longer-term political objectives of retaining influence in Greece after the war? Churchill believed that the return of the Greek king would be the best guarantee of British interests in Greece. Had there been a powerful royalist resistance in the mountains, there would have been no problem, but in Greece there was none. So the British decided to back a pro-British resistance. Napoleon Zervas was to lead what became Greece's second largest resistance group, Erdes. But Zervas only agreed to go to the mountains after being given a 48-hour ultimatum by the British, that unless he went, they would denounce him to the Germans as their agent. The British then sent in a team of SOE saboteurs, to set up headquarters with Eves. Alas's attitude to us when we arrived, and for that matter, I am the political um, component uh, as well. I think they were highly embarrassed uh, when we arrived because they were doing very well without us. We were expecting the British as our allies to help us in any way possible. But in fact, they tried to divide us into groups, all under British control. What SOE planned to do with the Greek resistance was to set up uh, more or less independent, small-scale guerrilla bands in all parts of the country, whose activities would be coordinated through British liaison officers, who would in turn be under the control of our GHQ in Cairo. This was quite different from the intention of Ellis in particular, which was to set up a large-scale conventional army under centralised control inside Greece, which would eventually form the hard core of a post-war 
army in Greece under left-wing control. Uh, there was therefore difficulty in co uh, reconciling their purposes with our purposes. From the moment the English became involved, they had one aim, to hurt the operations of Alas, so that Churchill would be able to impose his plan to get the Greek king back in power and through him perpetuate Britain's hold over Greece. In spite of their opposed views, Elas and the British sometimes worked together with great success, using captured German war materials and British supplies. In November 1942, in a combined operation, SOE, Elas and Eves blew up the Gogopotamos Bridge, which cut Rommel's supply line to Africa for six crucial weeks just before the Battle of Alamein. Meanwhile, the British continue to try to win support for the return of the Greek king. Yorgos Papadagoulis, a leading liberal, was invited to dinner with the British military mission. We talked about various things. Then the last question the colonel asked me was, why don't you want your king back? I said we don't want him back because he supported the Metaxas dictatorship in 1936 which denied us any freedom of speech and took away all civil rights. And I'm asking you, if your king did such things to you, would you want him? He didn't answer me on that. Wherever we went, uh, it, it was quite obvious that Aam, alas, either or both, uh, feared that we would reimpose the king of Greece uh, under the protection of British bandits when Greece was liberated. In March 1943, the widely respected Stefanos Sarafis was given the military command of Elas. However, SOE's successful cooperation with Elas did little to alter Foreign Office opinion that the main goal of the Greek resistance was to establish a communist regime in Greece after the war. The Foreign Office would have preferred that there should be no resistance whatever. Uh, at one point, a leading official in the Foreign Office wrote a minute saying uh, that the, uh, the best level of sabotage in Greece would be no sabotage at all. The Greek government in exile was based in Cairo. In August 1943, Brigadier Eddie Myers took a mixed delegation of resistance partisans there to discuss the future of the Greek king. Discussions broke down when the partisans, together with most of the Greek government in exile, demanded that he should agree to a referendum before his return to Greece. Well, this was an anathema uh, to the king of Greece himself, and it was an anathema to uh, the foreign office, obviously. And the king of Greece became extremely worried and signaled Churchill and Roosevelt, who were then uh, at Quebec conference, and, and they said, oh, you, you stick for us. You, no need to sign away your abdication at this stage of the game. The resistance delegation was dismissed as both irrelevant and embarrassing and was sent back to the mountains. For his pains, Myers was recalled to London and sacked. That same month, August 1943, at Quebec, the Allies decided they wouldn't need to involve Greece in any major military operations, and the Greek resistance therefore became less important. In Moscow in October, Stalin indicated to Antony Eden that he was not concerned with Greece. This enabled the British to put their long-term political considerations in Greece first. In the war cabinet in November 1943, it was decided to destroy the power of Eam Elas leaders and to build up the power of Zervas, now a royalist. In Greece itself, the continuing hostility between Eves and Elas erupted into open conflict. Once the fighting broke out between Elias and Edes in October 1943, the British authorities decided that Elias was solely to blame uh, for this outbreak. Uh, and therefore, uh, uh, SOE was instructed to cut off all supplies to Elias until the fighting ceased. Elias blamed Edes and accused it of collaborating with the Germans. Zervas certainly had a means of contact with the Germans. He had at least a couple of officers uh, who were members of Eves, 
uh, stationed quietly in Janina, which was General Lanz's headquarters, General Lanz being the German commander. And these officers were certainly in irregular contact with, uh, with, with Lanz and with Lanz's staff. The war in Europe still had over a year to run. In Greece, a truce was arranged in January 1944 between the two resistance groups. Meanwhile, Elas had begun to organize society in the territory it had liberated. In April, it set up a provisional government in the mountains. Elections were held and women were given the vote for the first time. <laughs> I remember that the government made beautiful things happen and we were raised to a higher level. The other governments had neglected the peasants. Beautiful things happened, like voting. I voted and we helped in the local government in any way we could. The solidarity and understanding that were generated up here in the mountains and the enthusiasm for self-government made people so much more aware and sophisticated that those of us who came up from Athens just couldn't believe it. People's courts were set up in the villages, and I was selected to be a people's judge. We judge various cases, things like property, mainly small cases, no murders or anything. I did my duty as I have been chosen, and I became a judge, although I was illiterate, of course. There were no lawyers here in the mountains. I don't know what was happening in the towns. Here in the villages, we didn't have to pay anyone acting as a lawyer. We only had people's judges who judged according to their consciences. In general, the people were very pleased with this people's government. We had general assemblies every month, and every villager could air his grievances and criticize the chairman or councillor when he didn't do his duty. We made decisions for the whole village. Whatever happened in the village, everyone had to know about it. That was how self-government worked. When we started to govern ourselves, we got encouraged, and people woke up, so to speak. We became more active and took more responsibility for ourselves. We wanted this government to agree to the separation of church and state and that priests should complete secondary school and have theological degrees. In the meantime, we joined the resistance and the churches contributed however they could. There was no discrimination against women. All the girls were working in the resistance together. And the partisans respected the female sex. They had a lot of respect for us. In April 1944, Greek troops in the British army in Egypt mutinied in support of this provisional government. Churchill instructed the British commander to put down the mutiny. After 10 days without water, the Greeks surrendered, and the British sent 8,000 of them off to prison camps in Sudan, Egypt, and Libya. The British then hastily arranged a conference in Lebanon, at which they hoped to set up a national government acceptable to Ayam Elas. The conference was a success. The British nominated the liberal politician George Papandreou to be prime minister, and the delegation from the provisional government in the mountains agreed to a coalition government under him, in which they would have six out of 24 seats. The British were very optimistic, 
But in Greece, the news was greeted with dismay by the Elas partisans, who now controlled four fifths of their country. Οι πέρα στο Λίβανο αναγνωρίζοντα τα κόμματα τα οποία δεν διέθεταν παρά μονάχα μια, πώ να το πούμε, παλιά. Our delegation signed the Lebanon Agreement, which gave authority to the old political parties when they had no power in Greece at all. By then, EAM was the most powerful political force. And yet, the delegation agreed to participate in a government where they only had six out of 24 seats. That was the first step in the downfall of our movement. Although the conference was judged a success, the British were still worried about the extent of Ayam Elas's power. In August, Churchill wrote, It is most desirable to strike out of the blue without any preliminary crises. It is the best way to forestall Ayam. In October 1944, he went to Moscow to firm up Allied plans for post-war Europe. With Stalin, he made what became known as the Percentage Agreement, giving Britain 90% influence in Greece in exchange for the Soviet Union having 90% influence in Romania. In good humor, Churchill told Stalin, it's a pity God did not seek our opinion when he built the world. To which Stalin replied, this was God's first mistake. In Greece, as liberation approached, tension mounted between Elas and the British. One bone of contention was the British attitude to Greek collaborators who had worked with German security forces. Our attitude was, and we met them before the Germans left, to say if they did not surrender their arms and surrender themselves, they would be arrested and tried as collaborators. We did our best to get them to surrender. When we started the negotiations, we were putting pressure on Mikhail Aras and the others who could see that there was no way out of surrendering their arms. At that moment, the English officer intervened and said, you surrender your arms if you want to, or if you don't want to, you don't have to. The negotiations came to an end, and we realized that the Englishman had turned the tables on us, and so the collaborators didn't surrender their arms. We failed, I think, because they feared we were too few in number to protect them from Elas. Elas would have allowed us to take their surrender if they, Elas, had taken their arms. In the event they did not surrender, in the event they should have been arrested as collaborators. I think about that time, the attitude of Elas to us did begin to change. I suppose a single incident brought home to me the change of attitude when Ypsilantis, then a very senior Eras commander, made what was um, one of the great Greek gestures of contempt when he tugged his lapel in referring to British troops, uh, which is one of the most contemptuous gestures in the very rich vocab Greek vocabulary of gesture. It surprised me then, it surprised me now, it surprises me now, and I think the only reason one can give is that Eras began to see that the British, who were then expected to come in um, to the Peloponnese initially, uh, could be a factor, an obstacle, to their intention of taking over power. They usually accuse Elas of wanting to seize power. It's a stupid view. There was a power vacuum in Greece. There were occupying forces and quizzling prime ministers, but the Greek people didn't recognize their governments. The people were creating their own popular power in their own right through the resistance. EAM didn't try to take power. EAM had power. I have no doubt at all that they could have occupied Athens at the time when the Germans left, and they could have made it very difficult for allied forces to return to Greece without having to face an opposed landing.
In October 1944, four months after D-Day, with the Allies on the offensive throughout Europe, the Germans were forced to pull out of Greece and the British entered unopposed. The swastika came down from the Acropolis and in spite of some misgivings, all Greeks welcomed the British troops. When we got to Athens uh, itself, although we hadn't actually seen a German, we were treated as though we were conquering heroes. And uh, across the roads there were banners saying, hip, hip, the British troops. There were posters and streamers from the trees. The walls were all marked with welcoming signs. And uh, as we walked along the streets, we were, we were cheered, we were hugged. Sometimes we were kissed. People came up and gave us flowers. These were days of enthusiasm and joy. We poured onto the streets, and when we saw the English for the first time on the tanks, in the vehicles, our joy was such that I remember feeling that they were my brothers, my friends, liberators. I trusted them. I remember we danced together. I don't know whether we were dancing English or Greek dances, but we were dancing and kissing. But within six weeks, the British were in armed combat with Elas and its reservists in Athens. It had been agreed that a new Greek army would be formed, and the argument was over who was going to be in it. For the British, the question was how to disarm Elas. And for Elas, it was how to retain its military power on at least an equal footing with the royalist Greek troops then returning from Italy. I can remember them marching down the main street of Athens and our great relief that at last Greek troops had come in and we, we were not the only people responsible. This was a turning point. Of course, in a way, you might, may, might say that for the communists who were participating in the government, it might be regarded as a little bit provocative in the sense that they realised that the head of their government, in which they were participating, was bringing his army in. The British and the Greek governments, along with the royalist troops, wanted to restore the old order in Greece. They wanted the king back on his throne because he was the best guarantee of British interest in Greece, political, economic and strategic. Churchill was adamant in his support for the king's return and wrote to Eden that having paid the price we have to Russia for freedom of action in Greece, we should not hesitate to use British troops to support the royal Hellenic government. I fully expect a clash with Aeon, and we must not shrink from it, provided the ground is well chosen. Negotiations between the Greek government and Elas about the composition of the new army continued with bad faith from both sides. On December the 2nd, the Prime Minister George Papandreou banned an Aeon demonstration against his demobilization plans. The Aeon ministers in the government resigned, and the demonstration went ahead. It was to end in tragedy. At about two minutes past 11, the police suddenly opened fire on them. And they killed 11 or 12 people altogether. There was a man called Frank Pattenham, who was a British policeman, whose job it was to help to train the new Greek police forces being set up who went along in front of the police and kicked their guns up to stop them firing at the crowd. They, they were not firing over the heads of the crowd, they were firing into the crowd. And suddenly, as we were in Constitution Square, we heard for a moment the machine guns and the first dead. I ran to take photographs, but I didn't know what was happening. I mean, who were these people killed and by whom? What was happening? 
Later, within seconds, people gathered and knelt and started to sing the funeral march with fists high up in the air. On December the 4th, Elas attacked the police stations. On the 5th, Churchill instructed General Scobie, do not hesitate to act as if you were in a conquered city where a local rebellion is in progress. We have to hold and dominate Athens with bloodshed if necessary. The following day, the British came in on the side of the Greek government. British troops seized the headquarters of Eam, and from then on, it was open warfare between the British and Elas. They tried to stop us taking action against the security battalions who had collaborated with the Nazis. Men who the British first regarded as enemies and then later as their allies. Later, on the 6th of December, I was at the Macriani's battle. For me, the battle was an experience, a school, a university. For the first time, I understood what fanaticism meant. Rational thinking stops. Man is beyond himself. He cannot think, cannot function rationally. In the next few weeks, over 4,000 civilians were to die. In the House of Commons, Churchill faced a vote of censure for his actions in Greece. Justifying British armed intervention, he claimed that Elas had planned to march down upon Athens and seize it by armed force, and that it would have been incompatible with British honor to leave Athens to anarchy and misery, followed by tyranny established on murder. While the arguments went on in London, the battle for Athens continued. The bulk of Elas was in northern Greece, fighting the royalist Zervas, who had to be rescued by the British and evacuated to Corfu. There were only three Elas units in Athens, a week into the battle, the communist leadership was still undecided about what action to take and stopped short of ordering all-out attack against the British troops. Nevertheless, 25,000 reinforcements were sent in and by December the 15th, the British had more than 50,000 troops in Athens. In Italy, uh, or any, in any other theatre of war, if you saw a German, you shot at him. I mean, you did your best to kill him and if he saw you, he did his best to kill you. Uh, in Greece, we were a bit ambiguous about this, and so were they, I'm glad to say, as it turned out. Well, I thought we'd come to liberate the Greeks, but uh, within what seemed to be a short space of time, we were actually killing them. And, and more to the point, actually British chaps were, bit, were dying in, in a cause that I, I couldn't uh, quite understand. I think what most of us felt was that we didn't like the idea of fighting against people who were on our side. It wasn't what we'd enlisted for. Uh, we would do anything we were told to do, but it wasn't a welcome idea. These, the Greeks were on our side. They'd fought beside us in Italy. As the British stepped up their attack, civilian casualties mounted. On the 12th of December, the Communist Party called us to a meeting in a school in Kipseli. We were to decide what line to take and whether to join in the fighting. 
I knew the British were involved, but I hadn't seen them in action until that day when they fired at us with rockets. Ten people were killed, mainly students and actors, and twelve of us were seriously wounded, including myself. Elas began to take hostages and shot many civilians whom they accused, often wrongly, of being collaborators. The British had already begun sweeping operations and took their prisoners to the prisoner of war camp at El Daba in Africa. On my return home in the evening, I was captured. Without going into details, I was caught and sent to Africa. I found myself at El Daba. We were 28,000 of us there, surrounded by barbed wire. Among the mass of people in El Daba, there were all kinds of people. Most of them were not related to our movement. They did not belong to AM. Let me tell you about a neighbor of mine who was a milkman. He kept chickens in his yard. This man never got involved in anything in his life. One day his chickens got out and he tried to fetch them back in. A detachment happened to be passing by, found him outside and picked him up as well. Allies they may have been, but the Americans in Athens made a point of distancing themselves from British actions. The American ambassador, Lincoln McVeigh, who had uh, moved in and occupied the uh, quarters of the Gennadios Library, which belonged to the American Archaeological School, he was in there when some British soldiers came in and, and very thirsty from the fighting, tried to draw water from the well. He ordered them out in no uncertain terms and said, we're neutral, we're neutral, get out. See, that was the attitude of the Americans, this extraordinary thing. At home, there was an outcry in the press against the action of British troops in Athens. It was led by the Times newspaper. It so happened that I had the occasion to lunch with Robin Barrington Ward, who was then the editor of the Times, and I did my best to explain to him uh, of my experience and how I tried to uh, explain what had taken place in, in, in Greece. He was quite impervious to anything that I had to say. He was totally and entirely uh, sympathetic to the A.M. last position, and he thought that Churchill had gone completely off his head. In the House of Commons, Churchill said, there is no case in my experience, or at least wartime experience, where a British government has been so maligned and its motives so traduced in our own country by important organs of the press or among our own people. He defended his action by claiming that for three or four days or more, it was a struggle to prevent a hideous massacre in the centre of Athens, in which all forms of government would have been swept away and naked, triumphant Trotskyism installed. I suppose there must have been 40 to 50 uh, men and women who were involved in final policy decisions on this um, a dozen or so responsible British and American newspapers. They were very well informed, very intelligent, and at that moment in the war, they were enormously motivated to support Churchill's policy if they possibly could. Now, you've got two alternatives. Either one man, Churchill, was wrong on this business, or else 40 to 50 well-informed, well-motivated men and women, all at the same moment and on the same issue, all took leave of their senses and regarded Churchill as being wrong when he was really right. Well, I mean, the saying is, you can pay your money and you can take your choice. On December the 18th, the Royal Air Force headquarters in Athens was attacked and overrun by Elas. Two o'clock one morning. Surrender, comrades! <laughs> we were waking up much better than the alarm clock and there were a few shouts. And uh, there we were, I presumed, at war. We dressed, went downstairs to the where the rest of the chaps were, and more or less um, sat about 
talking about what was happening. No one really knew except that we were being fired at. And suddenly there was, a, you know, like a noise like um, a Venetian blind going up and down several times. Then everything went quietly. And then quiet, a little while later, it was just bang. And the shell came right through the Venetian blind at the window and went into the wall, way over to, the, over to my right, and burst in the wall, luckily. I was, probably wouldn't be here now. With RAF personnel now, alas, prisoners, Churchill flew out to Greece with Eden on Christmas Eve. He met with resistance leaders and Greek government ministers for two days. The outcome of the meetings was that a regency was set up under Archbishop Damaskinos. Churchill was finally persuaded that the king could not return to Greece before a referendum. Meanwhile, the fighting went on. With aerial superiority, the British gained the upper hand two weeks later. On January the 11th, Elas met British representatives with the Greek government and signed an armistice to take effect from the 15th. Throughout the fighting, the Russians remained silent. Since July, their military mission had indicated Russia's desire not to get involved, although the Greek Communist Party knew nothing of Stalin's agreement to stay out of Greece. The Soviet military mission didn't get involved at all in our problems. They kept a consistently neutral position to the point of suspicion. When we ask for support in arms and ammunition, the response was always, we will report your request. But right until the end, in December, we did not receive a single Soviet bullet. At the Yalta conference in February 1945, Stalin reconfirmed to Churchill that he had complete confidence in British policy in Greece. Churchill replied that he was much obliged to him for his attitude in this matter. There was a lack of political foresight among the Greek leadership. They should have seen that the two great powers would each try and get as much for themselves as possible at the end of the war. And in that power game, our leaders should have realized that Greece would be put in the British sphere of influence. What we can claim is that we left Greece with a free choice after the war. Uh, and this is what we aimed to leave them with. Our main purpose, uh, that is the purpose of us as a mission with the Greek resistance, was to ensure that no armed force could seize a monopoly of power when the Germans left. And this we did indeed achieve, and this, I think, is why uh, Greece is a parliamentary democracy today and not just another East European puppet state behind the Iron Curtain. I don't think the December events were a revolution. December was really a resistance by Eamelas against giving up what it had won and against giving in to the British and Greek government demands. Eam was squeezed. December was a forced reply. As the British say, Eam was cornered. Churchill fought like blazes to get to retain Britain in the uh, uh, Britain's influence in, in, in Greece. And uh, that's what had happened. Um, and, of course, I think Churchill, too, feared anything which uh, had the sort of mark of socialism on it because he thought anything was socialist was communist. Churchill is one of the greatest agents of the victory against Hitler. And nobody can dispute his enormous contribution to the struggle against Nazism. But for us, the Greeks, he was the greatest tyrant because he continued to keep Greece tied to Britain. On February the 15th, 1945, the Greek government met with representatives of Elas and signed the Varkisa Agreement. The government agreed to an amnesty for all political crimes committed during the December fighting and to remove from power all those who had collaborated with the Germans. 
In exchange, Elas agreed to surrender its arms. But neither the amnesty nor the purge of collaborators was carried through. The Varkiza agreement betrayed the resistance. Our leaders tied us up, hand and foot, and handed us over to those who had collaborated with the Nazis. The right choice would have been to abandon the conference and declare that they would continue the struggle outside Athens. We had this option. The whole of the Elas army was intact. Within weeks, thousands of Elas partisans were imprisoned. And two years later, in the mountains, came the outbreak of the Greek Civil War. In the closing months of the Second World War, the British re-established their control in Greece. They backed a government in which the Greek resistance, Ayam Elas, had virtually no power in spite of the fact that it ran four-fifths of Greece and had widespread support. The British attitude had led to armed conflict with Elas in the streets of Athens. After six weeks fighting, British troops crushed the Greek resistance movement. But the amnesty which had been promised never took place. The result was a two-year drift into civil war. Under the Varkisar Agreement, signed in February 1945, the communist-led Elas surrendered its arms. The Greek government was committed to an amnesty for political crimes and to removing from the police force all those Greeks who had collaborated with the Germans. But the purge of collaborators did not take place, and instead of an amnesty, the Elas partisans faced mass arrest. In the mountain villages, right-wing gangs began to terrorize anyone suspected of having been in the wartime resistance. When Elas surrendered, the government's men came out here in the countryside with right-wing gangs and did whatever they wanted. They killed people. They demanded that we each hand in three guns. I didn't have one. I had already surrendered the one I had. These right-wing gangs weren't officially part of the state security forces. They were part of a para-state. Our people, former partisans, were in trouble, and we didn't know what to do. I was arrested. I was a young communist in Salonika. The terror was widespread. Every day you could read in the newspapers the names of people killed in different villages and towns across Greece. One killed here, another there. It happened daily. It was almost a routine thing. 
They were asking us to hand in weapons all the time. When we told the gangs we hadn't got any, they beat us up. They used to make us report to the police all the time. I went to the police five times. This kind of thing went on for almost a year. Some people on our side, the left, also did some extreme things. It's true that they executed some people. The Communist Party was still functioning legally after the Varkiza agreement, but it did so in this state of terror. What we saw in Greece in 1945 and 1946 was a gradual oppression of the left and all those thought sympathetic to the left by the right wing. The right wing, being in power, used its power as the gendarmerie were formed and the National Guard was formed to ensure that the membership of the gendarmerie and National Guard were sympathetic to the right rather than the left. And increasingly, the left, which embraced a broader and broader spectrum of the population, was discriminated against. Throughout 1945, the British were in Greece in some strength and were largely responsible for appointing and dismissing the three Greek prime ministers who held office in quick succession. There was a, a time when we were almost literally governing Greece through other people because, first of all, all the supplies, all the relief, all the food, everything depended on our services. And secondly, there was no properly elected government. There had not been elections for many, many years. You mustn't forget that before the war there was a dictatorship in Greece. The governments of the English, that's what we call them. They started taking emergency measures. They suspended articles of the Constitution on civil rights. They introduced new decrees and special measures, which meant that the hundreds of former partisans who were arrested could end up going straight to court and then to be executed. There were thousands of men and women in prison and exiled. Hundreds of men were executed or condemned to death for nothing. The only accusation was that they had belonged to Elas. It was the English who were in charge of this whole business. Uh, we, the British, were, had got ourselves into a rather strangely false position in that Greece was a kind of British protectorate, but the British ambassador was not a colonial governor. In that we advised the gendarmerie, in that we advised the army, if the gendarmerie and the army then discriminated against the left, we could be considered culpable or at any rate sympathetic with that discrimination. I do not believe we were, but I do believe that had we been prepared to intervene more forcibly, as we did at local level, then we could have restrained what became a major civil war. By June 1945, 49,000 former Elas partisans were in prison. Three former prime ministers and the liberal leader wrote an open letter saying that terrorist organizations of the extreme right, which were armed by the Germans, have not been disarmed or prosecuted, but have openly allied themselves to the security forces in order to strangle all democratic thought. The more the terrorism spread, the more illusions our Communist Party leaders had. I remember in Britain when Attlee led the Labour Party to power in 1945 and became Prime Minister. Bevan was Foreign Minister. The left here said, now the situation in Greece will be resolved. At that moment, I happened to be in charge in, of the British Embassy in Greece as the ambassador had gone home for consultation. And to my great relief, within 48 hours, Mr. Ernest Bevin, the new Foreign Secretary, had sent a telegram to ask me to assure the Greek government 
that the previous policy would be carried forward exactly as before. The Allied powers met at Potsdam in July 1945 and the Cold War disputes began. Greece was to become a testing ground for wartime agreements over spheres of influence. The Americans demanded the reorganization of the Romanian and Bulgarian regimes. The Soviet Union replied by calling for the establishment of a democratic government in Greece. Meanwhile, in Greece, the government did little to halt the right-wing backlash. By now, 80,000 former Elas partisans were in prison. People who have fought in the resistance were leaving their homes, going to other towns, in the hope of escaping the right-wing gangs who were after them. Others went to the mountains. Gradually, their numbers grew until about 40,000 people were up in the mountains and began to form into defense groups. And from then on, when the army or the police or the right-wing terrorist gangs appeared, they armed themselves with guns to defend themselves. The Communist Party, under its leader Zachariadis, swung from one policy to another. They threatened to retaliate against right-wing violence, and at the same time they called for a more representative government. Bevin insisted that the Greek government should hold elections. When we asked the Communist parties for their opinion on what we should do about the election, the Soviet Union, which was the most powerful, said we should take part. Zachariadis decided then to do the opposite, just what the reactionaries were hoping. In spite of this advice, the Communist Party leadership decided to abstain on the grounds that the election could not possibly be a fair one. I think the leadership of the left fell into a trap. I think it was a mistake to abstain from the elections in 1946, despite the climate of terror and the daily killings. Because in response to the terror, many people on the left had already begun to think about responding to violence with violence. The elections finally went ahead in February 1946, although 10 Greek government ministers resigned in protest, and the Greek prime minister warned Bevin that four-fifths of the Greek state apparatus was now in the hands of extreme right-wing gangs. The West appointed a team of independent observers to see the elections were fair. Yorgos Papadagoulis was one of them. The day before the elections, he asked one of the village presidents whether he thought there would be many abstentions. And he said, who's going to dare to abstain? Men will pay a few visits beforehand. As the court representative, I was really alarmed. He said, don't worry, you won't witness it. You'll be asleep. I asked him what the men would do, and he said, they'll knock on particular people's doors, they'll be armed, and they'll simply ask the way to the next village. That'll be enough. Nothing more will be necessary. And so, that's what happened. In 1946, we voted in the election. On the top of our ballot box, there was a Sten gun. So you can imagine what kind of election it was and what the result would be. That's how the elections were conducted. Despite the fact that observers were sent by the British and the Americans, that was only for consumption abroad. The conclusion which the pollsters reached was that although the electoral rolls were very imperfect, naturally, because there hadn't been an election for 10 years, uh, nevertheless, it had been more or less fair, and the outcome was more or less uh, what was uh, to be expected. Constantine Tsaldaris and his right-wing populist party swept to power. The Communist Party under Zachariadis dithered. Finally, it decided on a limited mobilization in the countryside. A good while later, in June or July 1946, the party gave the order to take up arms and fight back. Και να απαντήσουν ενάντια σε εκείνους που 
πάνε να τους σκοτώσουν. So, those who were already being hunted by the right went up to the mountains. Με σκοτωμό, άρχισε να πας στα βουνά. And we organized the first key units of the second armed struggle. At the same time, any further chance of communist participation in Greek political life was eroded by the way the referendum on the future of the Greek monarchy was conducted. King George returned to Greece in triumph in September 1946. The conditions under which the plebiscite was held were even worse than the elections. It wasn't even a comedy. You can call it what you want. There was no freedom. People were under pressure. And so they voted for the king. In October, the Communist Party formed a partisan army out of its existing armed groups. It was led by the former Elas partisan Marcos Vafiavis. Its goal was to regain the power the left had won in Greece during the Second World War. Ο αγώνας μου κάτω από τις γραμμές του δημοκρατικού στρατού. I joined the partisan army because for me it was a continuation of what we have fought for in Elas, the wartime resistance for freedom and independence for Greece. When the partisan army was formed, more and more of us took refuge in it. Because it was enough to say you were from the village of Ziakas to get beaten up by the government army. Any woman who happened to be passing by could get beaten up. What could we do? We got up and left. It wasn't just one or two days, it happened every day. That's why people joined the partisan army. We followed the army too. I joined the partisans because my husband had already joined. I believed in its goals. When the first partisans appeared here, people started leaving to go with them. We had no plans to go to the mountains. No one wanted to go. We had no choice. We tried to get the right-wingers to meet us, to discuss things, and come to some sort of agreement to stop the terror. But they refused to talk. The partisan army went from village to village, recruiting those who sympathized with the political aims of the left. The partisans gathered people here in the school. They rang the church bell. They told us that they were taken to the mountains to wage a partisan war and invited everyone to join them. Two or three young lads from here followed them. The government army had already begun national conscription. Initially, it avoided known left-wingers, but soon found it necessary to conscript regardless of politics. Oh, Sitan! Those who were on the right will go happily. Some stay behind and ignore the call up. Still others enlisted. And then when they saw what was really happening, they deserted and joined the partisan army. And they were the best. In the bitter battles which began at village level, the fighting was regularly preceded by shouting matches in which traditional insults were freely exchanged. The government soldiers were shouting, you're Russians, Reds, Bulgarians, you've got no fatherland. While the partisan army was shouting, you're sold out, you're the Queen's lackeys, your sissies. At that point, the partisans overran the hill and pushed the government company to the edge. And they almost fought hand to hand. In the first months of the civil war, the partisans kept the initiative. This was partly due to the reluctance of many of the government army conscripts to fight other Greeks. The government army came over the top of the mountain just where the partisans were entering the village and started firing machine guns into the air. They didn't fire at the partisans because they didn't want to kill them. The government soldiers wouldn't fight. They didn't want to kill their brothers. There were lots of examples. 
Once, a whole government platoon surrendered and then joined up with us. Often, the prisoners we took later fought on our side. Many former Elas partisans were conscripted into the government army. Nikos Papanikolaou was one of them. On the whole, of course, those of us who were in the government army were happy when we defeated the partisan army. But I must tell you something. Once I saw three government army soldiers crying behind a cedar tree because Captain Velias got killed. It's true that when we were in the government army, we often got upset. Many of us had brothers with the partisans and sisters. People were happy or sad, depending on whether they had relatives or friends on the other side. The partisan army was by now 20,000 strong. Morale was high, even though they were outnumbered six to one by the government army. In the partisan army, we had hardly any arms. And in size, we were zero compared with the government army. Yes, they were better armed than us. But it was early days, and we had braver soldiers in the partisan army because we believed we were fighting for a better tomorrow. Throughout the winter, the partisans continued to hold the initiative. Meanwhile, in their embassy in Athens, the British were counting the cost of propping up the Greek government. We had saddled ourselves uh, with uh, very heavy responsibilities of direct subsidies to Greece for the payment of British troops in Greece and for the functioning of a naval mission, an air force mission, a military mission, a financial mission, a police mission, a legal mission. All that amounted to a considerable sum of money and we simply couldn't afford it. So the British turned to the only country capable of maintaining a commitment to the Athens government, the United States. Well, the British handed over the responsibility very abruptly. Ambassador Albert Franks called on the State Department one Friday afternoon while many were leaving for the weekend and handed a note to our government, which Secretary Atchison said he would deliver to the president, but in a sense uh, handed us the problem of Greece and Turkey. Uh, the British said in essence that they could no longer continue military and economic aid to either country. And they also told us that if we didn't go into Greece, that Greece would probably fall to the communists within two weeks. And uh, we had to have our answer by Monday. Their answer was the Truman Doctrine. We shall not realize our objectives, however, unless we are willing to help free peoples to maintain their free institutions and their national integrity against aggressive movements that seek to impose upon them totalitarian regimes. <laughs> this is no more than a frank recognition that totalitarian regimes imposed upon free peoples by direct or indirect aggression undermine the foundations of international peace and hence the security of the United States. The essence of the Truman Doctrine, as it was stated by President Truman in his message of March 12th, was to the effect that we as a nation would help those nations, members of the free world, who were struggling to maintain their independence against threats from without, to it Turkey, who was threatened by Russia, Greece, who were threatened by minorities from within, who were aided by outside countries. Remember, this was British territory. We had looked to you to run this area. And uh, we got in only because you asked us to do it. But when we got involved, we did it wholeheartedly. Had we not done so, there's no question that Greece would have fallen to the communists. The bulk of American aid went into military supplies to the government army. 200 American advisors were sent in. And a few months later, a joint US-Greek staff was set up. 
με το δόγμα Truman, την άνοιξη του, αν θυμάμαι, του 1947. When the Truman Doctrine came into effect in the spring of 1947, a new phase began and things changed for the worse. Things went against us because the Greek government got enormous financial and political help and military aid and equipment. The Greek state was essentially brought under American control in such areas as trade unions, uh, uh, foreign trade, the fiscal policy of the Greek state, conditions in prisons, uh, the salaries of civil servants, even social security was really controlled by American officials. Uh, obviously, in the military sector, the control was very, very thorough because the Americans provided not only the equipment but also the economic support for the armed forces, and therefore the Americans had a veto over anything that had to do with the Greek armed forces. During the summer of 1947, the government launched an offensive, but the partisans still held their ground. In the winter, on American advice, the Greek government began to relocate all the villages in the battle area. Partisan families went first. My family was taken to Trikala. They lived in a church there for two and a half years. That was my wife, my father, and my five small children. Well, they came and took us because they said that if they left us, the partisans would come and get us. And they said, We'd bake bread for the partisans and help them. I don't know. Anyway, we were moved to other places. As part of the civil war effort, the Greek government was now running a chain of island prison camps. By 1947, 32,000 people had been detained on suspicion of having partisan sympathies. In prisons such as these, they were ordered to sign declarations denouncing communism. I was never charged with anything. I was kept eight, uh, four years because I did not sign the certificate of property. Because I don't believe in saying that I'm this or that, I believe this or that. That's my own business. Nobody else's. Measures became more oppressive. There were courts martial of soldiers who deserted. There was exile of people suspected of being sympathetic to the left. The island of Trickery was used as a prison camp for women, but it was an astonishing sight because it indicated uh, the in indiscriminate nature of the backlash. There were on Trickery village women who may have given food involuntarily to the left-wing guerrillas. There were relatives of left-wing guerrillas there was uh, a lot of um, indoctrination and trying to get a signature. The pressure was mainly on uneducated women uh, who had a family, someone from the family who was uh, uh, with the guerrillas. There were 85-year-old women with us uh, and uh, lots of children whose parents, uh, or one parent, had been uh, with the guerrillas at some point, or was suspected to be with the guerrillas. Then, uh, woken up very early in the morning and uh, taken to the theater and had speeches, and uh, everybody said, now we are going to kill you, or you have to sign, or you die, and so on. The huge number of conscripts to the government army, who were considered politically unreliable, were now sent to the island camp of Makronisos, the torture squads of Macronissos were notorious. I was conscripted in 1947 as a soldier in the National Guard. And within four days, I was sent to Macronissos, simply because I had been in the resistance. I was a soldier for six months. And then I was sent to Macronisos. There were eight and a half thousand of us. A life was unbearable. We would be without water for a week, a whole week. Every night at midnight, Macronisos was full of moans and cries. Some men were killed and thrown into the sea. And the authorities would say, they committed suicide. Billy, 
μέσα σε αυτό το χώρο των 10 χιλιόμετρων χωρέσανε εννέα στρατόπεδα. There were nine reindoctrination camps, as they called them. Κακοποίηση τη προσωπικότητα του ανθρώπου. The system operated to wipe out any individuality and dignity or self-respect that you had. Δηλαδή τη υπογραφή δηλώσεων μετανία. They tried to force the thousands of men gathered in barracks all over the island to renounce their beliefs. The worst thing of all was that we were tortured by former Elas partisans who had been broken and signed a confession. These men got clean discharge papers in exchange for torturing the former comrades. These tortures had no beginning and no end. It was terrible. In September 1947, the Greek government offered amnesty to any partisan who would surrender. Few did. In December, the Communist Party announced the formation of an alternative government in the mountains. So the Greek government outlawed the communists. The battle lines were drawn. The partisans continued to hold their own, although outnumbered eight to one. Aside from the fighting, they also began to organize life in the territory under their control. Είναι το Γενάρη του 1948. In January 1948, the provisional government set up a teacher's training school here. Άνοιξε αυτό το σχολείο η διδασκαλική ακαδημία. There were about 60 or 70 of us training to teach the children in the various village schools. We were given tuition morning and afternoon in the different teaching methods and in the courses we were to teach. When we finished the training, we were each sent to a village school. The countryside was under their control. They'd reopened the schools, they ran a newspaper, they ran an officer's uh, training establishment. They had artillery practice and uh, everything you can think of, really. Throughout this period, the United Nations had a fact-finding mission in Greece. Its job was to investigate the extent to which the partisans were being aided by communist parties outside Greece, as the Americans believed. Well, the Greek guerrilla effort, which originally we estimated around 7,000, and which never got over 20, uh, was obviously a minority which had, which had been organized and directed from bases in Yugoslavia and Albania and Bulgaria. It was not an indigenous Greek organization. It, it, it was a, 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 the appendage of a communist organization. The voice of the democratic state was, of course, a lot of people. The aid the partisan army got was minimal. Of course, it was better than nothing. It was valuable, but we have very little ammunition of food. Uh, από τα περιμαχικά αυτά, να φανταστείτε ότι uh, ήταν και ο οπλισμό που παίρναμε. The arms we did get were old. Ήταν παλιό οπλισμό, λάφυρα πολεμικά. Usually they have been captured from the Germans during the war. Λάφυρα γερμανικά. Και πολλέ φορέ, ιδιαίτερα. Our machine gunners often had problems because the ammunition was all different makes and didn't fit the machine guns. And they had to make endless different combinations in order to be able to use them at all against the government army. The UN Commission was hopelessly divided along Cold War political lines. They arrived, most of them, with their views already known and their prejudices just to be confirmed. 
This was especially evident with the Russians, the Poles, and the, and the uh, Yugoslav and Bulgarian liaison officers who were attached to the commission. They were on the revolutionary side. Uh, the other side disassociated themselves, and this was most of all evident when uh, we went off to look at Marcos's headquarters and to interview Marcos. Uh, we didn't succeed in doing that because we fetched up in a little village about two miles away from the place where we, <laughs> from government territory. And uh, Marcos, I think, was five or six days away. And the American, British, and other representatives refused to go further. The Russians said they would go on. So the commission broke up there. One part went off to see Marcos, and the other part, uh, my part, went home. In the villages, both armies sought information on the other's activities. On both sides, the punishment for informing was usually death. The partisans instituted a system of people's courts. When a case about someone informing on the partisans came before a people's court or a military court, there was proper justice. There had to be sufficient proof and naturally these courts did pass the death sentence on some people and execute them. As the brutality of the civil war spread, thousands of people were made homeless, families divided. My father was conscripted into the government army. He was on the opposite side to my mother and myself. He risked his life by coming to visit us in the village every night because we were a close-knit family. He loved us very much, but he had to do his two years military service in the government army. Sometimes in the morning he'd still be with us and he'd have to hide in the granary until the next night when he could rejoin the government army unnoticed. We were caught in the middle. The army used to attack from either side of the village. One of my brothers went with the partisans, and lots of boys from here, aged about 17, 18, 19, went too. Often their fathers were already with the partisans. In 1948, some were forced to join. They would ask you, why don't you join? Are you on the other side? That's how it happened. The government relocation program was successful. Villages were deserted. Deprived of volunteers, the partisans too began conscription. When the partisans realized they needed more forces, the older people were put to work, baking. And us, the younger ones, were given guns. I was given a stain gun, and they trained us for 15 days in the snow with hardly anything to eat. And then we took part in the battles. My eldest brother was a volunteer. My other two brothers and myself were conscripted. We went to a village where we were trained for a month. Then we were split into units, and we took part in the battles. Throughout this period, there had been a long tactical argument on the partisan side between the army chief, Marcos Vafiadis, who favored a guerrilla war, and the communist party leader, Zachariadis, who wanted the partisans to switch to conventional tactics. Zachariadis won. <laughs> In August, I was expelled from the leadership because we had been arguing since 1947 about partisan strategy and tactics. Zachariadis kept insisting that we were an army and so should adopt conventional and army tactics. And he was saying that at a time when we didn't even have a place to rest our heads. I took the opposite view, that we were a partisan army and that one day we might become a regular army, 
But at that time, we certainly weren't. That was our difference. I think the leadership handled this issue very badly. It happened while we were right in the midst of the struggle. It really shouldn't have happened. And I think it was one of the main reasons why we were defeated later. A few months later, in the autumn of 1948, the government army launched Operation Summit on Mount Gramos. It was the beginning of a number of set peace battles in which the partisans were outnumbered 12 to 1. Under American pressure, the government pilots now used a new and terrible weapon, napalm. They started bombing the village with about eight or ten planes each time. The first time they bombed us, they aimed at the church and the school. When they came overhead, all 150 school children ran out of the school in a panic, crying. And some of us hid in the sewer under this plane tree. In the daytime, we rested and slept. As soon as it got dark, we went down the mountain and worked through the night building defenses. One evening, we'd gone to camouflage them, and an officer came and told us to go back up the mountain. We did, and as daylight broke, the smoke and the bombs started. Bam, boom, smoke everywhere. Virgin Mary. Airplanes, artillery, shells, mitrailleurs, automatic weapons. It was the end of the world. The end of the world. The partisans had mined the river, and as soon as the government army crossed it, the mines went off. The mountain erupted. The whole mountain was trembling. There was smoke and fire everywhere. The partisans were crossing the river with knives between their teeth. They'd go to the machine gun positions and attack. But the government soldiers kept returning with reinforcements. They had airplanes too. The partisans had nothing. Then we started retreating, going further and further back. And then, after the ceasefire, the men said, let the women go down. So we went and there was a guard from each army standing either side. I saw someone lying face down with his leg cut off, and I said to both the guards, get lost, both of you. So you've taken over the hill. What's the good of it? So many young people killed, mothers who will cry and suffer so much. And the army guard said, this is war, my fellow fighter. What can we do? I said, you fools. Things were so bad we had to keep a sense of humor. For instance, the reconnaissance plane that always came very early in the morning, we nicknamed the Milkman. The next plane we call it the Barrel Plane because it dropped barrels full of napalm which set the whole area on fire. There were 17,000 casualties in Operation Summit. For the government army, it was a strategic failure. The partisans returned to the Vitsi mountains and held their ground. Morale was still high. Nevertheless, the bombing of their area, coupled with the fact that the government had emptied all the villages, confronted the communist leadership with difficult decisions about what to do with the civilian population under their control. They decided to evacuate the children to Albania. They said they had no alternative. <laughs> But at the United Nations, the Greek government claimed the children were being forcibly separated from their parents so they could be brought up as devout communists. I had a small girl. We were fired on from the mountains with artillery and the soldiers accused us of hiding partisans. It was treachery. We were supposed to have done this or that. We didn't know what was going on. People were butchered right here, in the village square, and the children saw it all. The partisans were forced to form a committee to take the children away from here. 
Ήταν το στρατό, είχε τα μπροθή του στρατό και μας... The army had taken up positions facing us Βάζανε and we are firing continually. Τα, με τα κανόνια. Και σκοτωθήκανε πάρα πολλοί από εμάς. Each time we moved, they opened fire. Και έγινε κόπεδα μερικά. Many of us got killed. Young people, children and women were killed in the bombardments from the government army planes. Then in 1948 and 49, when things reached the worst point, we started leaving. From our village, the children were the first to go. Children from partisan families who had been left here alone with their aunties, whose parents were both partisans or had been killed on one side or the other. They went to Albania. When I was five and a half, I lost the two most important things in life, my parents and my country. I followed the defeated, and I saw things I would never have seen if I'd stayed here in Greece. I went with my mother and my little brother to Albania. The children left because they were terrified of the planes. Our village was bombarded. I had great difficulty finding the children in the evenings. They'd fled wherever they could. I was hiding in the fields myself. The children wanted to leave. My eldest daughter wanted to go, but I wouldn't let her. What would I have done all along? You should have seen what it was like. Mothers and children crying as they parted, like baby lambs parting from their mothers. We let the children go. What could we do? I kept my youngest daughter with me, and every morning she asked me, where can I hide today? 170 children left. They went past Marcos and began to sing. We were laughing and crying at the same time. We cried to see so many children leaving. The village was deserted. There was not a single child to help the priest in church. In 1949, there were still about 20,000 armed partisans, one in five of whom were women. The government army had 263,000 soldiers, backed by American advisers and officers of the newly formed CIA. The civil war was approaching its climax in the mountains of Gramos. Look how well the government army planned its attack on Gramos. They cut off the back of our Gramos unit. They started clean-up operations from Rumeli. They advanced to Thessaly and destroyed the Kosaka command. So there was no hope for a large partisan unit to help another by coming from behind or by carrying out any serious diversionary operations. The odds against the partisans were overwhelming in both men and equipment. In desperation, they formed whole units of wounded men. They were made up of people who wouldn't have been allowed in any army. They would have been sent home. Invalids, people with multiple wounds, who couldn't take part in any offensive operations. Their job was to stay in the trenches and man the machine guns. Even their retreat was a problem. These units tell you just how desperate the situation of the partisan army was. The government army launched Operation Torch. The Greek high command was so confident it invited King Paul and his entourage to have a grandstand view of the final defeat of the left. We helped carry the stretchers. To tell you the truth, we had no bread. We were so hungry. It was very foggy and pouring with rain. And we were told to go and collect an injured government army officer who was still alive. But as we approached him, 
what happened. He started to fire at us, the officer, firing at us. I was with two partisan women, one of whom was called Flora. We decided to lie down, but the officer still kept firing at us. So we threw stones at him. Two of us had brain guns. It was such a madlin, all the folk. Government soldiers on one side of us, partisans on the other. Then another soldier went up to the officer. He was Flora's brother. And then she saw him. She called him, and he recognized her voice and shouted, Flora. And just as he shouted her name, the wounded officer shot him. He killed Flora's brother. You should have seen her. She threw herself on the officer. We killed him. We tore him to pieces. He was a huge man. Then we left the place, and we took Flora's brother with us, even though he was in the government army, and we buried him. It was night time. We always walked at night, because in the day we would get fired at. <laughs> Finally, we reached the Albanian border. The army was advancing, our brothers from one side and from the other. I had brothers in the government army fighting against us. We didn't know what to do. We had no choice. They managed to capture us all together, because, of course, they had the arms, tanks, planes, everything, while we didn't have even a tank. It was true that we had no shelter at all. We were on our own. And it was our leadership's fault, because they had made us all gather in Vitsi and Gramos. That's why we were defeated and had to cross over into the People's Republics. We left because our choice was get killed, give ourselves up, or leave Greece. Orders were given to retreat to the Albanian border. It was obvious we couldn't hold the mountain any longer. So we thought we would move and reappear somewhere else in Epirus, probably in the Murgana. But when we crossed the frontier, we were told to put our guns in a heap, and the Albanian army personnel collected them. It was then that we realized that the war was being stopped for a while. Later, we went aboard ships, but we didn't at first know where we were going. Eventually, we arrived in the Soviet Union, and then we realized that it would be a long time before we would return to Greece, without, of course, realizing that it was going to take so many years. In Athens, the government celebrated its victory, but a 100,000 Greeks had died in the civil war. The left had lost, its supporters in Greece were in prison, and those who fled abroad were to spend the next 30 years in exile. The civil war was fought for democracy. But there are people who are greedy. Let them burst from their greed. Democracy will come one day.
By September 1949, the Greek civil war was over. The left had lost. Many of its supporters had gone into exile. Many others remained interned in Greek prisons and island camps. Behind a facade of parliamentary democracy, the revenge of the victorious right was to continue for another quarter of a century. If you ask young people in Greece what happened after liberation, they immediately say the dictatorship. Between liberation and the dictatorship, there is a silence that has lasted 25 years. It isn't only the right who are responsible for it. Left-wing parents are also to blame. They didn't tell their children about Greece's recent history because they didn't know what to say or because they were afraid to talk about it. It was summer and we reached Albania at dawn. Then we went down the other side of the mountain with two or three partisans. The Albanian officials gathered the children together first to take them to these block countries and they told our parents that they would join us later. They put us into some big military lorries. There was pandemonium. Little children were sick. They would get lost. They didn't know who they were or where they were going. We were alone, without the men and the children. The children were going to the children's homes. How to find the children? How to communicate? We did not know the language. What did we know? Nothing. There were some interpreters. They knew a little. By the winter of 1949, more than 100,000 Greek political refugees had crossed the border into Albania. 25,000 of them were children. In the chaos of this exodus, families were separated and village after village was left deserted. Within a few months, Stalin called a meeting of Eastern European party leaders to decide the future of the Greek political refugees. Each country took the quota it could cope with and trained the majority to become industrial workers. There they started telling us what to do, that we would go to the factories to work. They helped us in everything. They tried to reunite us with our men, if we had a letter or if we had a clue as to where they could be. We left. All our group went to Romania. We were working in the factories in Romania. We worked here and there, and we lived well. I stayed six and a half months in Albania. Then, on July the 20th, we went aboard a ship. There were about 700 injured men on board. Five days later, we reached Poland, and we went straight to the hospitals. It was quite nice in Czechoslovakia. They welcomed us, gave us clothes, they gave us everything. Then we were told to leave, and I rejoined my husband in Russia. Within months, the refugees were being resettled throughout communist Europe. Although no one knew how long they would stay, planning began immediately for all aspects of their new life. A call went out for teachers, and Greek schools were set up across Eastern Europe. Elie Alexiou was living in Paris. She went to help in Hungary. I got a telegram asking me whether I could go to one of the People's Republics to help with the education of the Greek children who had crossed into Albania at the end of the civil war. So I went immediately. In Hungary, 
We were in kindergartens in some of the big houses which used to belong to the feudal landlords. The three of us stay in Hungary. My other brother we had lost. We didn't know where he was. We started the hectic work of writing books. How do you teach children, 30,000 children, without even an alphabet book in your hands? At first, we were only teaching a few days. We were so frantically writing the books. But by the end of the first year, we had reading books, alphabet books, physics and chemistry books. The children were very well treated. They clothed them, they fed them five to six times a day, and they taught them how to read and write in Greek. The Polish people welcomed us with such hospitality. They gave us opportunities we probably wouldn't have had in Greece, even if our side had won the civil war. I finished secondary school there, and I studied music, which I love. In Hungary, the Greek refugees began to build their own village. In 1950, I went to Hungary. I helped build the Beloyanis village. We built the village for the families of the political refugees, for the old men and the old women and the young children. We made the village Beloyanis so that later the old men and women who could not work could go and live there. They were given a pension by the Hungarian government. We were waiting from day to day. We said, things will change, we'll go back to Greece. We were not living. Our body was there, but our soul was here in Greece. All the refugees were engulfed by this tremendous longing. It was like an illness which no medicine can cure, only going home can cure it. But it would be 30 years before the exiles were allowed home. In Greece, elections were held in 1950. The veteran liberal politician Plastiras won on a platform of national reconciliation. Many political prisoners were released, but there was no general amnesty for those who'd fled abroad. Greece was overtly a parliamentary democracy again, but real power remained with the monarchy and the army under American guidance. In 1952, Parliament voted for a new constitution, but the emergency legislation against the left remained in force. Anyone considered a threat to state security was sent into internal exile. Many resistance and civil war partisans were interned for another 20 years. What was it like, my child? It was a dramatic situation. We got married and lived together for less than a year. Then they took him and he was away for 18 years, 8 months and 4 days. You judge for yourself what it was like. I was arrested in 1945 and was charged with some others with being an accomplice to the murder of a collaborator. Had you committed it? No, we hadn't. That was a problem. When you're in prison unjustly, it is worse. And it tortures you a lot. The state was by far the largest employer. To work for it, everyone had to have a certificate confirming their political reliability. Without it, you couldn't work, have a driving license, or carry a passport. In 1952, Ritsa Papa Theophilou was released from the prison camp on the island of Macronisos. After specializing in neurology and psychiatry, uh, I worked in the only hospital where they would accept me without a certificate of probity. It was very, very difficult to get a job, not only for doctors, for everybody. 
In my neighborhood, there is a cemetery. To become a grave digger, you have to have a certificate of political reliability. Even road sweepers have to have one. If somebody wanted to work in any of the state theaters, they had to sign a declaration and renounce their involvement in the national resistance against the Nazis, their beliefs, their whole past. The concentration camps were still open then, and there were many artists interned. Whatever strength there was in the intellectual life of Greece had gone. All the intellectuals were in prison, were in internal exile, or had left Greece. Although the Greeks had voted for an amnesty in 1950, in the growing Cold War climate, and with the Americans pulling political strings in Athens, repression against the left intensified. Legislation originally intended against spying was now used against communists. Manoli Glezos, a national resistance hero, found himself condemned to death for the third time. I was elected an MP in 1951 while I was still in prison and while resistance fighters were still being executed. With the end of the civil war, the executions did not stop. They carried on. The big political trials which have marked our country's history started then. The first big trial was the Beloyanis trial. The second was the Blubidis trial. And a bit later, in 1957, the spy trial, in which I was accused of being the leader of a spy ring in our country. Throughout the 50s, leading communists and their families who were not already in prison or exile lived in hiding. Niki Homenidi was 11 years old. It was quite difficult for me to adjust because all of a sudden I stopped going to school. I continued my education at home. These years were very tense. I was the only one to go out. I used to go and do the shopping. There were times when I walked the Kalithea Nea Smirni route two or three times until I was certain that nobody was following me to the house. Nobody was supposed to come to our house and no one was meant to learn who we were. We had other names, false names. Eleni Vulgari's two sisters were in Poland. She was 18. I was hiding from 1954 when I lived underground, until 1966, when I was caught. I was in hiding for 12 years. Of course, the conditions were very bad. It was difficult for the people who let me stay with them, because, of course, they were taking a risk themselves by sheltering me. Many times I stayed in abandoned houses, and several times I slept outside, without bread, without money, without anything. But my faith in the Communist Party gave me strength to carry on. When school children were required to write about the recent history of their country, those from partisan families faced a special problem. I remember at school we were given essays on the subject of the betrayal of the nation by Aam and their gangsters. Many pupils refused to write the essay. Others refused to write against their parents if they had taken part in the national resistance and they got expelled from school as a result. The children were going to school and when my daughter left, the teacher wrote on her graduation certificate that her father's occupation was a gangster instead of a farmer. And the child said, but I will never get a job if you write that. But the teacher refused to change it. This discrimination made it increasingly difficult to get jobs. I used to get asked to the police station often, 
and they told me to stop supporting my parents and any other members of our family who were in prison at the time. And I was ordered to denounce them. This happened many times. The last time it happened, I said to them, stop bothering me because I'll never do either of the things you want. And they said, okay, but it will cost you your job. And it did. Though most of the refugees who left in 1949 were still in Eastern Europe, a few were able to return in the 50s with the help of Greek charities. It happened through the Greek Red Cross and with the help of a Polish teacher I had. He had studied literature, Greek literature, and he said, go and see your country and then come back to continue your studies. But when I saw Greece and my parents, I couldn't bear to leave again and go back to Poland. I arrived in my village through the Greek Red Cross in Konica. Somebody helped me there to get on a lorry and go to Sarandapolos because there was no road. He got me off the lorry. He told me that my father was going to come and fetch me. In Sarandapolos, of course, people were using animals for transport. I was waiting to see my father. I didn't remember what he looked like. And it seemed to me that all the men passing by were my father. But at last he came. Did you find things in the village as you had expected them? No, but I stayed because of my parents. They were living in a house without a roof. When the conservative Konstantin Karamanlis became prime minister in 1955, the repressive legislation against the left continued. In the villages, the open bitterness of the civil war period remained. The right continued to settle old scores, especially at election time. In 1956, the left even found it difficult to get hold of ballot papers. Later, in the 1958 elections, things were the same again. We did not have any ballots then either. And in order to show some women how to vote for the left, I had to draw the left-wing ballot form from a magazine so that they would realize what it looked like and vote for it. There were only five votes for the left. But when the results were announced, they almost lynched us. The politicians wanted us to vote for their party, not for any other one. They were saying that if we voted for them, they'd release our husbands. The politicians would come one after the other saying, if you vote for me, I'll get your husband out. And if you don't, they may send your husband even further away. So then we came to the 1961 elections, which were the culmination of electoral fraud and violence. Not only did the authorities, that's the police, use violent means, they also used fraud. There were more votes than voters. Even the trees voted. Karaman Lise's right-wing National Radical Union retained power. But in 1961, the liberal leader, George Papandreou, challenged the election result and called for a relentless struggle to break the grip of the right. Two years later, the MP Gregory Lambrakis was murdered by the right after he addressed a peace rally in Salonika. This marked the beginning of a mass radical youth movement. It was led by the composer Mikis Theodorakis. One of the students was Maria Faranduri. The main point was that it wasn't only a political organization, it was also a cultural one. During that period, any reference, written or spoken, to the resistance in the towns or villages where there had been battles meant you could be taken to court. 
Theodorakis got round this censorship by indirect reference to the civil war and the oppression of the left. The repressive emergency legislation was still used from time to time. Eli Alexiou was charged with having made an unpatriotic speech 15 years before. One fine morning, it comes up that there is a warrant to arrest me, and the police came and took me to the other of prison. I was completely unaware of the existence of such a warrant because it had been issued 15 years ago during the civil war when many totally innocent people were arrested with false warrants. Mine was a fabrication from beginning to end. But it was proved that the allegations were false and the Court of Appeal, to their honor and to my relief, unanimously found me innocent. In 1963, Karamanlis resigned and new elections were called. Yogos Papadagoulis was a legal observer. The day before, he discussed the elections with one of the village presidents. I asked him whether there would be any left-wing votes, and he said, yes, there would be some. I asked how many there had been at the last elections, and he said that there hadn't been any, because no one had dared to vote for the left. So I asked him why he thought there would be votes for the left now, and he said, because before, that had the police on their side, but now the police no longer dared interfere. Those elections were truly free elections. Papandreou won on a program of democratic reform, and the majority of the political prisoners who were still behind bars for their wartime resistance activities were finally released. Vios Mikalopoulos had done 18 years. When I came back to Karabana, the situation had changed enormously. I was reunited with my family, with my wife and my son, who was then 19. When I saw him again, I felt so happy. I felt such joy. And we got to know each other. And now we have a specially close relationship. In 1965, Papandreou was forced to resign after his attempts to limit the power of the army met with royal opposition. For the next two years, the palace was at the center of a bitter political row over its part in the fall of Papandreou, and its future was openly debated. The political crisis ended on April the 21st, 1967, when a military junta seized power with American support. For the next seven years, the Greeks were ruled by a right-wing military dictatorship under George Papadopoulos. The dictatorship was the result of the politics pursued by the right-wing parties and by the palace in particular. Because the king wasn't the king of all Greeks, he was the king of the right. And he disagreed with Papandreou's policies. He didn't like Papandreou trying to limit the role of the army. He considered the army his own private property. The dictatorship was closely linked to the Medaxas dictatorship of the 30s and to the extreme right of the 1940s. They cannot share the same ideology as the Greeks who collaborated with the Nazis. The Kenners had their roots in the right of the 40s. Many of them have been active on the right then. For example, Papadopoulos was a Nazi collaborator. Patakos and Zoidakis were are the court marshals of partisans. And Ioannidis was the arch torturer in the prison camp in Macronisos. These people had operated unofficially since then. 
And when they took over, they became the official state. Eleni Vulgari was the last person to be tried and convicted under civil war legislation before the colonels took over. When the dictatorship came into power in 1967, on the 21st of April, little Milpiadis was two months old. I got up that night to breastfeed him, when the walls of the Aviarov prison were shaking as the tanks rolled by outside on the street. The first night of the coup, before anyone understood what was going on, 10,000 Greeks were arrested all over the country. All these people were arrested on the basis of files kept on them, from lists that existed in every police station, in every neighborhood and in every village. This gigantic mechanism consisted of records that dated from the time of the civil war. Right-wingers from the 40s were now back in power. They were quick to bring back repressive laws from that time. Security committees were again active, and the old island internment camp at Jura was reopened. As soon as I heard about the dictatorship, I left the village on the pretense of doing some washing at the river. The police came and caught me and took me away. I left my washing behind. They wouldn't even let me take my dress, which I had hung on a tree. I found myself in Jura with all the others. One army personnel carrier full of women and men, all in Jura. I was in Jaro, where there were already 10,000 people. I went to Jura, where there were already 10,000 people. They were of every profession. There were 15 journalists like myself. There were many doctors. There were solicitors, engineers, farm workers. It was a microcosm of the social strata. The colonels had ruled Greece for six years when hatred of the regime began to erupt in student demonstrations. In February 1973, the students occupied the law school. Six months later, they took over the polytechnic. The colonel sent in tanks and police who shot 30 people dead. Mass arrests followed, and Andreas Nefaludis, like his father 25 years earlier, found himself in an island prison. At Jura, we were of all ages. The youngest was 19, the eldest 72. We were scientists, workers, students, and whatever you can imagine. I was never beaten by the security police at Euro, because my father and my uncle had never renounced their beliefs 25 years earlier. So they said, what's the point in beating him up? He's not likely to sign if his father didn't. It was the beginning of the end of Papadopoulos' rule. Power passed to Ioannidis, head of the military police. After his unsuccessful coup against Archbishop Makarios in Cyprus, the colonel's regime finally collapsed. The ringleaders were subsequently tried. During the dictatorship, we had a phenomenon unique for Greece, which was that left-wingers, centrists, right-wingers, and many Democrats from the right all fought together against the colonel's dictatorship. They took part in struggles against the dictatorship, and they were persecuted and found themselves in prison. This provided an opportunity to meet and get to know each other, and so there were bonds forged which had never existed before. In 1974, the conservative leader Karaman Lys returned from exile in France to form a coalition government. A new constitution was voted in. The emergency legislation of 30 years before was finally abolished, and the Communist Party was legalized.
In December 1974, there was a referendum and the monarchy was abolished. Λοιπόν, η δεύτερη περίοδος μετά από την δικτατορία, θυμάμαι, ήταν μια εκτόνωση... The second period, after the dictatorship, I remember it was a period when people wanted to let go. People would gather in football stadiums, in large spaces, to sing together, to celebrate the return of democracy. In 1976, an informal amnesty was put into effect for those still in exile from the civil war years. Each person's case was still individually examined, but the requirement to recant political views was now tacitly dropped. Taxiarchis Balomenos had applied many times unsuccessfully to return to Greece from Poland. In the end, his village signed a petition asking that he should be allowed back. <laughs> We stayed 31 whole years in Poland. Then things changed. In 1974, Karamanlis came. We prepared our application to return. Here in my village, they all signed a petition asking for me to be allowed to come home. Everyone signed it. I came back all of a sudden. I went to my house. Everybody welcomed me. It was very moving. People had nothing against me. What else is there to say? For years, for decades, I had not seen such a landscape, with such beauty, with such sea, mountains. And when we reached Piraeus, I did not expect to find such a welcome. I have five brothers. They were all there with their wives. They were friends, comrades, old partisans. My life was good. I had the best possible treatment from the Russians. I couldn't have asked for anything more. They gave me every opportunity to study, to work, to have a house and a family. My children were settled in school. But I dropped it all because in the end, I just couldn't live without Greece. Those who returned brought with them a whole generation of children from abroad. Luba Karitsi grew up in the Soviet Union. When we came back to our country, our parents were so happy, their joy was beyond description. Because they had fought in these parts, they had grown up here, and they had left against their will. They always talked to us about Greece. My parents were born in Greece, and they were always talking about what it was like. They were longing for Greece. They wanted to come back to their birthplaces. When my mother came in 1979 for the first time with my father, she cried. And at the frontier, when she came off the train, she put some Greek soil in a bag. Uh, this love for Greece, perhaps from our parents' side and from our side, was a little blind. Their love was for Greece as they remembered it, not for how Greece really is. It became obvious how unrealistic they had been when they did return, because many of them were very disappointed. Some got so depressed that they committed suicide. There are people who 
These were people who had started their life three times over without hesitation, and they came here with enthusiasm. We were worried about what would happen to them, but they said they'd work, they'd rebuild their lives, and they weren't afraid of hard work. So people who came back qualified as doctors and engineers took jobs as manual workers on building sites. The reaction of the children to their homecoming was more mixed. Urania Karayani came from the Soviet Union. Everybody was asking us, why do you want to go, since you were born and raised here? You have lived here all these years, the best years of your life. And we said that we had always been brought up by our parents to think of Greece as our home, that they talked about it every day. We were taught Greek songs and dances. In our school, we learned the Greek language. All these years we were living there, the key thing was that they were bringing us up with love for Greece. Such a great love that for most of us, our only thought was about when we, the Greek children in the Soviet Union, we go home to Greece. My father used to tell me what life in Greece was like, how they grew up, what happened during the war, how the Greek people fought, what they suffered. After everything our parents told us, we thought we were not ordinary children, but the children of heroes. When they arrived in Greece, many were swiftly disillusioned. We lived differently there. We were born there and used to that life. We found things tough here. In Greece, even if you want to find a job, you can't. You need to pull strings to find work. We've got a lot of problems. And there is nowhere to go here, no theatres, nothing. While there, we had cinema, theatre, circus, everything. What can you find here? Nothing. We were living differently there. There, we were like Greeks. And then we came here, and were treated like foreigners. Our parents fought for so many years for this Greece, for a different Greece. And we see here that some people call us Russians and things like that. By 1979, nearly everyone from the village of Ziakas had returned home. Nikos Paponikolaou, conscripted into the government forces in the civil war, had never left the village. <laughs> Our joy and relief when our relatives returned was almost unbelievable. They came back after so many years away. They left as young people and they came back with families, some as grandfathers with grandchildren. It's been a great social upheaval. It's as if they've come back from the dead. When I came back, I was at death's door. But since I've been back in my village, rebuilding my house, my life has improved. And now I'm very well indeed because that longing to return was fulfilled, and I'm going to die in my own country. I am happy because I've come home. Our country is a beautiful one. We fought for this country. We fought. We gave blood. And I'll die now as a patriot, as a Greek patriot. We like this village. We like the land where we were born. So we came back and we've stayed. Nobody has bothered us. Each person knows which their land is. We go to our own houses and shut the door. It's all over now. Not everyone in the village feels the same. One or two people are very bitter. Yanis Papatheodoru was the only member of his family not to join the partisans. These are the people who want a regime which they will run, an autocratic one. We don't accept that the few should rule the many. 
They are different from us because they want to bring about a change of regime. It can't be done just like that. That's why the rest of us who stay behind in Greece don't accept things like that. Let me tell you, in our village, since they came, there has been chaos. Those of us who were here, and the majority who came from abroad, we constantly clash in the courts about property. Whether the day will come for these divisions to be overcome is too early to say. Later, perhaps. I don't know. In the 1981 election, Greece went socialist. Seven years earlier, the socialist opposition party, PASOK, had won only 13% of the vote. Now it won 48%. Part of its platform was a call to re-establish national independence. There were times when the English and American ambassadors were appointing governments in Greece. Then PASOK came. And when Papandreou talked, I personally, but also all Greeks, I believe, we felt a head taller. We felt such a national pride because at long last there was a Greek prime minister to talk as an equal to his equals. With PASOK's victory, the wartime resistance was officially recognized for the first time. And in 1982, an amnesty was announced for all political refugees still in exile. The Sartaris family had waited 35 years to be reunited. Our mother was alone and she was telling us because she was illiterate. Go on, write a letter to your father, find out how he is. All these years we were waiting for him to come back one day. After a while, he sent me a letter and that was the first time we heard that he was alive. Before then, we did not dare think it. We said he must have been killed. We were always discussing it, that one day we would come back to Greece. Well, we said, those of us who will live long enough will make it back to Greece. I had made many applications to come back to Greece, but it was when the right was in power. Karamanlis, and before him others, but they wouldn't grant my application. I eventually came back in 1984. Among those who now returned was Marcos Vafiathis, who had led the partisan army in the civil war. Many times I was thinking it's better to be in prison in your own country than to be a refugee abroad even if you are in the People's Republics or the Soviet Union. The thing is, I did not make an application to return permanently to Greece because I felt I did not have a right to leave before the last political refugee had left for Greece because I was one of the principal leaders of the partisan army. I'm optimistic about politics today because PASOK acts as a lever for change to the extent that it's now possible. Change today is taking place within the existing framework. Given that we've got a capitalist system, it's not possible to have any fundamental change in that system at this point. Mrs. Vulgari had been in prison on and off for 15 years. Her younger daughter, Eleni, had been in hiding and then prison, and her two eldest daughters had been in exile in Poland. I have been back in Greece for a year. I came back from Poland. It is very moving to be with my family again, especially when I see Eleni. She was only 10 years old when I left, and now she is a grown woman. I felt so happy when my sisters came back. I never believed that when they left for Eastern Europe, they would be in exile for 30 years. I thought they'd just be away for a short while. I 
this worried me. What can I tell you? I look at my daughters and I can't believe my eyes. I told myself that I would never see them again. Now they have come back. I look at them and I am all joy. I never expected it. But here you are. The time has come for all of us to be together again and telling you our story. Although a lot of time has gone by and I have forgotten these things, sometimes when I see some people alive and the others no longer here, naturally things come to my memory. Nevertheless, we all talk to each other now and greet each other. In Greece today, memories of the civil war are still vivid. Just as an interview was about to be recorded for this film with Yorgos Stavrakis concerning a battle in which he had commanded the partisan army, an old man spoke up who had fought in the same battle on the government side. They came in from over there. They attacked us. Where were you then? Here, in Burazani. What happened exactly? We left. Did you see them? No. What happened? We left. There was one come there and one there. There were Greeks too, like us. But we fled, my girl. Did you see them again? Did you meet them? No. Never? No. Well, I am Stavrakis, the man you're talking oh? about. I was a partisan captain who took Burazani. <laughs> It was me. It was my company which took Burazani. What are you telling me? When we came up that hill there, there was a garrison, a platoon. At 0600 hours we got them. Then we came down to Marmara here. We fired with the machine guns. You were firing from over there, especially from up that hill. You had the flag hanging from the guardhouse. Then one of our companies crossed the river took position there and fired at you. Then we crossed the bridge. I crossed with them. We run, we run. Life to you. Bravo, my brave man. He knows it well. He was a captain. Yes, I was. That's how it was. Oh, my, oh, my, oh, my. We are bound with these events from our childhood. Then we saw them as images, but now we understand what happened differently through ideologies. With all these conflicts, one says to oneself, this land is precious, it's worth something, it's gone through so much. Although you can't see much, it's all mountains, you understand? In 1985, PASOK again won the elections. Today, national reconciliation is the official policy of the government in Greece. For the first time in 30 years, recent history is discussed openly, mistakes recognized, and blame apportioned. But for those who lived through the civil war, in which more than 100,000 people died, reconciliation is still a gradual process. For many people, the antagonisms went too deep. The memories are too bitter. But on one thing, both sides agree. Never again. Tears come to our eyes after 40 years for our tongues to be loosened and to tell you all these things. Unfortunately, we went through some bitter times, but we hope that the Greek people can overcome them. Yes, all our problems. We hope that we will go forward. We will always go forward, never back, never back. I tell my children there should be no war. If you want to fight, fight with politics, but without arms in your hands. With arms, I went through it, and I don't want anyone to pick up arms again. We say the same too. We tell our children, don't touch arms. You can see what we suffered right up until now and the children we had to send abroad. We tell the younger generation we hope they never see wars, not just on Greek soil, any war. My husband died. 
My brother got killed. I suffered. Even today there is division. My niece tells me, we'll live better, Gran. We will live better. I can see that things are getting better, Gran. Things are getting better. Tell us again, Gran, about the partisans. Tell us again. And I tell them, you treat it as a fairy tale. But I lived through these events. We had our dreams about Greece, what it was going to be like. We had also our own human dreams. There were many who said to each other, if you happen to live, if the bullet does not find you, remember when you drink the wine of freedom, drink for me too. When you feel like going for a walk along the beach, do it for me as well. These are the feelings we experience now that we can drink the wine of freedom, now that we can dance. At this moment, inside us, there is the voice of those people which speaks. And we dance for them, we speak for them, and we sing for them. We sing for them.